get started. So we're really uh, lucky to have John Lee here today. Um, John is an assistant astronomer at Space Telescope. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc at Space Telescope and also at John Hopkins when he did his PhD at Rutgers. Um, and he's going to tell us about astronomy re maximizing the scientific value of galaxy imaging surveys with deep learning. So please take it away, John. Cool. Thanks so much, Ethan. And thanks for having me here. Uh, it's my first time in Pasadena. My slides are not advancing. So that's good. Um, but uh, okay, okay, here we go. Now it's going. Um, yeah, no, so it's, it's lovely to be here. Um, I hail from Baltimore, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. So if you're ever around, definitely uh, swing by and say hi. I used to think that Baltimore had one of the highest per capita you know, populations of astronomers uh, with Johns Hopkins. There's a applied physics lab there and Space Telescope. Uh, but Pasadena is pretty high, I think, too. So in any event, you know, uh, definitely swing by if, if you're in the area, give me a shout. Um, so it's my pleasure today to talk to you about uh, two very exciting fields in astronomy today. Um, first is observing galaxies using wide area surveys with incredible sensitivity and scale. And the second is the growing role of machine learning and specifically deep learning. So I think that these two fields are really important for uh, supplementing but not replacing targeted observations. So I was just saying, I, I did my thesis work on targeted observations of all kinds at all wavelengths um, from near infrared uh, integral field spectroscopy to you know uh, far infrared and some millimeter observations of cluster galaxies and observing neutral uh, hydrogen gas uh, out to you know high redshift, uh, higher redshifts uh, with radio interferometers, um, and I think these are essential for you know targeting astronomical sources that we need to understand better. Uh, in addition, you know I think machine learning is really allowing us to do all sorts of interesting new analyses, especially with archival data sets. And so we've seen a couple of the things that are possible with machine learning in the last few years. In the next decade, I think we're going to start to see uh, that machine learning will be critical for making some of the next big discoveries. So I'm going to get started with the structure of my talk. So first, I want to provide an introduction of how galaxies grow and evolve um, and why we may want to make better use of their images. Um, and to leverage all the information in the image domain, we're going to need to be familiar with uh, some way of letting machines see uh, so I'll talk about convolutional neural networks, CNNs, and show some cool science results there. And then third, I want to uh, you know, shift gears and talk about an exciting new method for discovering dwarf satellite galaxies at very low redshifts and present some of those new results and probably some future directions. Finally, I'm just going to touch upon you know, a strategic path forward as we enter uh, the data-driven era of large surveys with Rubin Observatory and the Roman Space Telescope. And by the way, at, at Space Telescope Science Institute, I, I work on the Roman Space Telescope team. So, you know, if you have questions about that, I can also uh, chat with you later. So anyway, let's get started with uh, the growth and evolution of galaxies. We know that dark matter collapses under gravity at early times um, and forms hierarchically into these structures called halos, right? And so you can see one here where, um, you know, mass is accreting into the center of this halo. And uh, this is in an end body simulation with only dark matter. But on the baryon side, you can also see that gas is accreting into the centers of these halos on, on smaller scales. And as stars condense out of these cooling gas clouds, a galaxy is formed. But I kind of like to think more abstractly and summarize the growth of galaxy using this curve here. This is the uh, star formation history. And you can see it uh, from early times in the universe to some you know, cosmic noon where star formation rates are high and then maybe some later time of observation. And this is tied to the cold gas accretion history because as we said, you know, the gas forms uh, into stars. The, uh, this blue curve is also connected to um, the chemical enrichment history, which I've shown in red here. And this is the rate of production of heavy elements over cosmic time. And the reason why that red curve is following the blue curve is because we expect heavy elements to be nucleosynthesized inside stars, right, which are formed according to that blue history curve. Uh, but as I said, I'm an observer, so I care about what we can infer or measure uh, from galaxies. We obviously can't watch a galaxy grow in real time and assemble stars. Uh, that happens over, you know, 13 billion years. So um, what we might care about or be able to measure is the instantaneous star formation rate here. Uh, which you can really think of as the blue curve at that end point here, time of observation, or maybe average it over a few, you know, millions, tens of millions of years. 
we can also measure the total stellar mass, which I'm kind of saying is a like related to the, the integral of the blue curve, right? It's the area under that blue curve. Um, of course, you have to make some assumptions about the initial mass function or mass loss or even X to two star formation and whatnot, but it's you know kind of proportional to that. And the metallicity, which is the abundance of heavy elements relative to the primordial hydrogen, that's related to the area under the red curve. So that's now I'm just writing here as the integral. And of course, modulo some assumptions. Since the star formation history and the chemical enrichment history are correlated, we might also expect that their integrals are correlated. Um, and so if we were to measure the masses and metallicities of over 100,000 galaxies, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey did 20 years ago, we indeed find that there is this tight scaling relation. This is the mass metallicity relation uh, extending over you know, two or three orders of magnitude and stellar mass um, and enabled by the you know, wide spectroscopic survey uh, from SDSS. So this highlights the, you know, the power of large spectroscopic surveys. Um, this, by the way, of course, is Christy Tremonti et al's seminal work. Um, and it confirms that you know, our simple picture of galaxy evolution makes sense. And of course, we can also use more complex statistical models or models with more realistic physics than you know, whatever it is I'm showing here, because you know, using uh, semi-analytic models or halo occupation models, you can statistically populate dark matter halos with more realistic galaxies or galaxies with better, more realistic properties. Um, and these sophisticated models, I think, represent a great step uh, in the right direction uh, with our understanding of galaxy formation and evolution. They're very successful. And yet, we haven't discussed one of the most important properties of galaxies, which is their incredible morphologies. Because we know that galaxies come in all shapes and sizes since you know, Edwin Hubble's tuning fork diagram here, this morphological sequence, uh, the morphology of a galaxy really reveals and it's connected to the ongoing physics that drives the evolution of that galaxy. And to highlight this point, you know, uh, I, I wanna show you how much more information rich you, uh, you can have, uh, sorry, how much more information you can have uh, compared to a photometric catalog, which is typically what we see in the data-driven regime of galaxies. <coughs> so each of these galaxies here has the same G and R band magnitude. So this is a very, very boring table. Uh, and I've done that on purpose, of course. But when you look at the actual images of these objects, this is just a random selection, we find that these morphologies tell us about so many more things. It tells you where and how the stars have been forming in the galaxy or if it's been passive, passively evolving. Um, and this kind of information is so important that, as I'll show in a moment, you can actually estimate the gas phase metallicity of a galaxy just directly from this kind of an image cutout. And so in order to get there, we're going to need to teach machines how to see. I'm, and I'm talking about computer vision now with neural networks. So uh, after talking about the, yeah, so let's talk about the methodology a bit. Okay. So this is a high school textbook kind of image of a biological neuron, right? A neuron is a cell um, and artificial neural networks are motivated in part by you know, biological neural networks. So we know that these cells, these neurons take in electrical signals um, through their dendrites, they're somehow processed in the cell and it may propagate out the signal on the right here, which connects to other neurons, great. But that sort of depends on whether or not the neuron is firing or activated is the term I'm gonna use. And so this axon then, you know, is passing along the signal. And we, uh, if we look at the biological neural network here, I think this is a rodent brain. Um, we can see that, you know, these neurons are not just randomly connected. They're actually organized into groups or discrete layers. And so researchers are able to study how, you know, signals flow through different regions of these biological neural networks in order to accomplish different tasks. And so an artificial neuron is similar, you know, it's represented like this. We have the inputs represent as X's and um, the neuron is taking in signals and uh, basically multiplying them by the model parameters, these W's or weights and summing them up. Uh, and those are passed through a nonlinear activation function. So this is what's going on out here. And artificial neural networks can also be organized into layers, just like in the example above. But since we want to learn the information in galaxy images, we want to use CNNs, which are composed of these convolutional layers. And so this here is an input image. It's basically just a five by five grid, right, of pixels shown in blue. And we also have a convolutional filter now overlaid in white. 
And this filter is a three by three matrix. It, you can think of it as some sort of simple image feature, like a color gradient or an edge or something. And so the, again, the images are the X's, the uh, filter is a part of the CNN model uh, represented as the W's. And where the filter is similar to the underlying image, the convolution produces a large output such that the result, which is shown in green on the right there, is a map of how similar the input image is to the outputs. And so at this point, we also can apply the activation function. So then this output is either called you know, a feature map or an activation map. Okay, so this filter can then scan across the image and continue to build up this map of features, just like a matched filter algorithm, if you're familiar with that. And you can imagine repeating the process now, except that your feature map is serving as the input for the next layer in your CNN. And so again, you're taking the outputs and sending them in as the inputs to the next layer of convolutions, where you can then search for more complex or higher order features. Um, and you may be able to find you know, simple features, things like point sources or edges or whatever. But as you progress through the network, you expect to find uh, more complex features like spiral arms or dust lanes or H2 regions or whatever you might find in your data set. Uh, and finally, you've got this uh, kind of this uh, feature vector here, which is just a bunch of heights, uh, which describes everything in the image. You can kind of think of that as uh, a row in a table where each image is converted into this set of morphological features, vocabulary, if you'd like, uh, which are the columns of some table, right? And so what you're doing is training a CNN to extract the, the most relevant or most interesting morphological features in order to solve some problem. By then, you know, taking a nonlinear combination of those features, you can then make some sort of prediction. And to summarize all that, I'm going to use this trapezoid here to represent a CNN. Um, I purposefully did not use a black box here because the model is interpretable. Um, and I think that there are sometimes, you know, criticisms of machine learning in the astronomy community, so valid criticisms, and, and I want to address some of them head on, right, in two different ways. The first is that we can actually interrogate the CNN and ask it to reveal the pixels that it looks at whenever it makes a prediction. And the second is that we can actually go ahead and verify predictions uh, with follow-up observations, like they're not post-predictions, we're truly making predictions and then seeing what the observations, the ground truth is. So you'll hear, you'll hear more about that in a moment, okay? I just want you to think of not black boxes when I say CNNs. Okay, so back to the method now. Um, we're training a CNN by giving it examples of images and labels, which the prediction should resemble, the labels. And it comes up with a flexible set of morphological features that are needed in order to make the best predictions. And we're not hard coding any of these features, these morphological features, it learned purely from the data. The upshot is that we can actually train a CNN to estimate the gas phase metallicity purely from Sloan Digital Sky Survey optical imaging cutouts like this. And this kind of method uh, ended up being a lot more accurate than I expected. We were getting typical errors of um, the gas phase metallicity of less than 0.1 dex. And this ended up being um, so accurate that when we used the CNN predicted metallicity to construct the mass metallicity relation, we found that it added no extra scatter to the relationship. So here the CNN predictions are in red with the spectroscopic uh, measurements in black. And typically whenever you try to reconstruct something with a method like this, you would expect, uh, and, and you know that there's some error, it would broaden the scatter from the ground truth. Uh, but interestingly enough, it doesn't happen here. So this demonstrates that some of the scatter that from the mass metallicity relation in the black curve here, which we thought was intrinsic, is actually explainable by another parameter. At least that's one interpretation of it, right? Because similar to how some other works have found that the star formation rate of galaxies can explain some of the scatter, um, we also find that a CNN is able to learn morphological information, which explains some of the scatter in the relationship the true intrinsic scatter is narrower. So I think in this case, machine learning is telling us about something about the physics of how morphology <laughs> is connected to how they've grown. Another thing we can do is, um, I said I was interested in uh, studying the neutral atomic hydrogen content of galaxies. And we can estimate that actually directly from images. So this is set up as a, a regression problem. We basically are able to estimate the gas mass fraction. Um, and this is really important because uh, H1, neutral hydrogen is the dominant phase of gas in a uh, cold gas in low Z galaxies, but it's um, also pretty hard to detect in other galaxies. So um, we need to understand how galaxies grow on long time scales from their gas reservoirs. So not only are we able to estimate the gas mass fractions pretty well, 
But we can also get a CNN uh, to tell us which pixels in the image it looks at in order to make its prediction. So in both of these two examples, these are gas-rich galaxies, but we can actually ask it to highlight in the center columns here, we can ask it to highlight which pixels it would look at if it were to make a gas-poor prediction, even though it doesn't. And as well as for a gas-rich pr uh, prediction, which you know is what it knows to be the correct answer. And so you can see here that it highlights you know, some of the, uh, the H2 regions out here, possibly creating material and the gas-rich disks in terms of evidence for this being a gas-rich prediction. Um, and it highlights the older stellar populations that you see kind of at the centers uh, for gas-poor predictions. So this is kind of what I mean by saying that CNNs are not black boxes. Also, we can understand how galaxy environment can co-vary with H1 and the morphology of the galaxy. So this is uh, kind of complicated, but I'm, I'm running an experiment where I've trained on galaxies that are found in all environments except those in the lowest density environment. So galaxies and voids, we're going to reserve that, hide that from the training data set. We're going to train a neural network on all the other galaxies. And then we test it on this you know, reserved data set. And it turns out that the CNN does perfectly well. It, it gets low error. Uh, and it's able to connect the H1 content to the morphologies of those void galaxies. But then we can continue to repeat this experiment as a function of environmental density. And it turns out that in the most overdense environments, we find that uh, this CNN totally breaks down. You end up with very high error in groups and in clusters. And the reason I think is pretty straightforward, right? We know that ram pressure stripping, tidal forces, gas depletion processes, these all become very important in very overdense environments. There's you know, intra-cluster gas that's like 10 million Kelvin that can be stripping away some of these galaxies. And so the H1 and the morphologies of those galaxies are somewhat disturbed. But the CNN allows us to measure exactly at what point the connection between morphology and H1 breaks down as a function of environment. Um, there are also numbers on the proper version of this plot in the paper. They're not just qualitative descriptions. Um, but finally, in this last example, I want to show that we can actually predict the entire SDSS spectrum directly from PanStars imaging. So in this case, we have PanStars uh, GRIZY images, which are shown here. And you can see the Sloan uh, spec spectra, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Sloan spectra, which are shown in black here, and our predictions, which are reconstructed in red. So these have been de-redshifted and somewhat compressed, so it's at a lower resolution. But the upshot is that we can train a neural network to predict those variables and recover the spectra very accurately. Um, as you can see, there's you know, a, a bit of a, you know, error on the bluest side of the spectra, and that makes sense because the Sloan spectra go into the U-band, whereas the PanStars imaging give you no constraint there. But the results are really stunning. I, I think that this was a big surprise that we could do this well in terms of recovering the spectra of galaxies. Um, and you might be right to be skeptical because I also was kind of surprised to see that this would work. Um, and it turns out then, uh, you know, shortly after we like wrote up this machine learning conference paper, uh, there's, uh, you know, somebody on Twitter was asking, Benny Holwer was asking on Twitter, um, this is, you know, my favorite galaxy. And he was like, oh, does anybody have a spectrum of this thing? It's right outside the Sloan Digital Sky Survey footprint. So there's no, you know, spectral fiber on it. Uh, it's also kind of a weird galaxy. It's very beautiful, but it's huge. It's, uh, you know, about 150 kiloparsecs in diameter. It's also in a very isolated environment and has no recent interactions, right? So, I was like, well, I don't have a spectrum of this thing, but I do have this neural network that I just trained, which can tell you this spectrum. And so we predicted that there's this weak AGN in this galaxy. Um, and later on, we were able to dig up some spectra that were taken in the 80s. We had to like digitize some of them. There were a few new spectra that we took um, and we found exactly what we had predicted. This galaxy indeed has low luminosity AGN. And you can see that on the BPT diagram here, this kind of tells you about the ionization. Uh, state of the gas at the center. Our CNN prediction is that blue triangle. And it's kind of interesting. You can see it's nestled between the green and the red uh, uh, markers here, which are all on the AGN side. But based on our prediction, um, which is tuned to the Sloan three arc second fiber aperture, it's right in between you know, the, the smaller and the larger aperture sizes, which is exactly what you would expect if the AGN signal uh, at the center ends up being a little diluted by star formation um, in the larger aperture. 
So this is kind of an interesting example that not only does our CNN work, but the astronomical <laughs> intuition for you know, what it's learned is tied to the kinds of systems that we are able to see. This really is extracting physical information directly from images. Okay, so quick summary thus far is that, you know, we know that CNNs learn morphological features uh, and they can piece together these features in a way that reveals incredible wealth of knowledge about how galaxies have grown and evolved. And so we can use it to estimate uh, the spectroscopic information like the gas metallicity, the neutral hydrogen content, and even the entire optical spectrum. So let's continue. Um, now, having shown some cool science results about how CNNs work, I want to talk about some ongoing work uh, and recent work called XSAGA, which is extending the Saga survey with machine learning. So to get started, I want to issue a challenge, which is uh, on this screen. Um, I want you to pick out all the dwarf galaxies. It's not the one in the center. Uh, around that one, that one in the center, OK? Um, so the reason I want to talk about satellites and dwarf galaxies is that you know they have a, a tough life. They're faint and difficult to detect, uh, but they're also easily destroyed, right? Their growth can be stunted by all sorts of physical processes, some of which we don't understand super well. So from cosmic ionization to star formation feedback, blowing themselves apart, ram pressure from the hot halo of the central galaxy or tidal forces that can tear them apart. Um, they're very sensitive to all those kinds of things. And it's no wonder that they're really great for comparisons to theory, right? Because they can offer constraints on all sorts of physical processes. You may have heard of the missing satellites problem or the too big to fail problem. Um, this is generally when simulations are predicting too many galaxies, satellite galaxies, or too many luminous satellite galaxies. And modern simulations are able to solve these kinds of problems by invoking baryonic physics. So we need strong observational constraints to test these physics, both the baryonic physics and on the dark matter side. And so of course, one set of valuable constraints comes from studying the satellites, that are uh, or the dwarf satellite galaxies around the Milky Way and M31. Uh, but we'd also like to be able to place the local group in a cosmological context and get more statistics. So this is exactly what the satellites around Galactic Analog Survey or SAGA is doing. Um, by leading the charge on getting the largest sample of satellite galaxies around Milky Way analogs at about 40 megaparsecs, uh, they can take a spectrum of every faint pinprick of light around each of these host galaxies. Um, and what you're seeing is the satellites up here Anything that could conceivably be a satellite galaxy, maybe 500 or so candidates per host galaxy, of those, only about three turn out to be real satellite galaxies. So you're seeing, you know, just a sampling of, of some of the new satellites that were discovered. So SAGA is a very complete survey, right? But it's also an observationally rigorous and fairly inefficient one. Um, it, you know, only a fraction of a percent of the spectroscopic targets actually turn out to be low Z satellite galaxies. But with a CNN, we can use both the low Z galaxies and the background contaminants uh, to train, you know, the, how a neural network might identify low Z galaxies. And you can obviously see that they're, they're quite different in this image here. And after we train our CNN, we can go ahead and go back to our wide area surveys and look for low Z galaxies all over the sky. So what we've done is been able to grab 5 million image cutouts across the legacy survey about 15,000, 14,000 square degrees and identify all of the low Z galaxies. And just to make sure I explain the method, you know, again, Saga is basically a targeted survey of every faint pinprick of light that could be a potential satellite around low Z Milky Way analogs. Um, and they have maybe, you know, a half percent success rate. And what X Saga is doing is training using all those spectroscopic data and then extending that to the wide field regime. And to be clear, we're not predicting the redshift of a galaxy here. It's always less than redshift 0.03 is what we're looking for. We're just classifying the ones that are nearby versus far away. Okay, and here's just a quick slide showing that our method really works. This is a redshift histogram with real data from the uh, DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Um, and uh, what I'm showing is that the CNN selection in green is way better than the other photometric selection that's been used by the Saga team. Um, which is showing that you know all the low Z galaxies, which we really want uh, from the high Z interlopers. You can think of that as like wasted telescope time for the purpose of getting low Z galaxies, right? And so we can reliably get a, a low Z galaxy about 20% of the time compared to the original photometric selection, uh, which is only about 1% purity. And so this is a factor of 15 or 20 times better 
And this huge increase over the five year low Z survey, you know, we can get something like a half million redshifts, right? And this is how our CNN is really able to shine. Okay, but while does is ongoing, we can go and actually just go ahead and try to search out all the low Z galaxies with machine learning right now. So previously, this is with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the NASA Sloan Atlas Catalog. There's about 17,000 galaxies in this patch of sky here. Uh, and we went ahead and found 100,000 new ones. I'm gonna go back and forth a bit. You can see that we're going to fainter magnitudes naturally because Sloan caps out at about R of 17.8. Um, and this is like equivalent to like 200 dedicated nights of GMOS time, right? Uh, Multi-object spectrograph. Uh, we're able to then assign these low Z uh, galaxies as satellites around more massive host galaxies, which are already known. And we find 10,000 satellite systems using the CNN approach, which is 100 times more than what we can get with Saga. It's also useful to look at individual galaxies. So I've just picked out a couple of random ones here. These are Milky Way mass galaxies that are too far for Saga to study. So these are the centrals. And we can also look at some of their hosts. Um, in this case, one of them is uh, spectroscopically confirmed here, but we find two other plausible candidates next to it. You can also go into overdense environments, which Saga doesn't try to study, right? Because they're not really Milky Way analogs. This is a brightest group galaxy. And in fact, it has seven confirmed galaxies, bright galaxies uh, next to it. And yet we were, are able to find another 13 down here, including this little patch of, you know, five very red um, and what appear to be passively evolving satellite galaxies. And these are really hard to confirm spectroscopically. So I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can do with this kind of data set. Okay, by the way, did people find any satellite galaxies here? Maybe, Maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah, some blobs. Yeah, I mean, I kind of tricked you, right? Because there actually are, there are no spectroscopically confirmed galaxies in picture. They're too low surface brightness. Uh, they're not hit by SDSS. Um, and this is slightly outside the Saga redshift range. So it's also wasn't looked at by them. But the CNN selects these two objects as satellites. So if those were the ones that you looked at and honed in on, then at least you're you know, agreeing with the, with the machine. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna show four quick hit uh, results on XSaga just to show um, how productive the CNN method can be. So first we can measure satellite radial profiles as you see here with really uh, unprecedented statistics. So this is the number of satellites within some radius uh, binned as a function of host galaxy stellar mass. So clearly we see that more massive hosts have more satellites, but we can also split um, on the host morphology. So here, uh, I've divided the sample of you know, hosts into disk and elliptical galaxies. And now we can see that ellipticals actually have more satellites than disk galaxy hosts at the same mass. Although there's this kind of interesting covariance going on here. Uh, we also can investigate the halo formation or accretion history. Um, the y-axis here is showing the number of satellites within the virial radius. Uh, and the x-axis is now the magnitude gap between the brightest satellite and the host galaxy. So, you can think of it as the larger the magnitude gap, the more time has elapsed since the last halo accretion event. And because the satellite, uh, so the sorry, the central galaxy is tidally disrupting its satellites, this increases the magnitude gap over time. And tidal destruction is of satellites is the proposed solution for the too big to fail problem. So with too big to fail, it says that you know we see too many bright satellite galaxies unless tidal forces are needed to destroy those satellite galaxies. Uh, but with Xaga, we may be seeing some direct evidence in support of the theoretical solution of the too big to fail problem. And then here we're seeing some satellite galaxies along the major axis um, versus minor axis. We find that the ones on the major axis are redder in nature than the ones on the minor axis, um, which are bluer. And this is true for both, uh, both and you know, uh, true for massive and less massive host galaxies. What we see is something that's consistent with a picture where um, denser and cooler CGM is kind of in this extended toroidal or disky like structure along with the, uh, the disk or major axis. So that satellites that are falling in through that region might be stripped more easily and therefore uh, not able to form as many new stars. This is also in line with a, a recent paper from illustrious TNG that implies that X AGN are excavating their CGM along their minor axis which has the same net result. The, there's an under density of gas there and therefore less circumgalactic stripping of satellites that infall. So the physical mechanism that drives that is different with AGN being the primary source, 
Um, but in any event, this is kind of another interesting phenomena that, that we can constrain with X saga. And finally, we see evidence for different satellite populations around isolated and paired host galaxies. So for example, hosts in a M, uh, Milky Way M31 configuration tend to have more numerous satellites. So galaxies in these paired configurations, they also tend to be redder in color. Um, whereas isolated Milky Way analogs at the same stellar mass tend to be different, right? They have fewer satellites and bluer colors. So this is something also that we want to explore in more detail, but we might believe that isolated and paired host galaxies are occupying different dark matter halos, which is responsible for this. And there's a lot of productive things that we can do here. We can talk about planes of satellites or dwarf pairs or small groups um, of, you know, in voids and low density environments and satellites of satellites, et cetera. Um, the point, the upshot that I want to make is that, you know, with these kinds of machine learning selected uh, samples, we can really start to do more com uh, complicated analyses with the, the larger statistical power. And finally, as I mentioned, we can also extend this method easily. Once LSST comes online, we can use that deeper imaging coupled with new DESI spectra to continue to push uh, the, you know, deeper into the uh, next generation galaxy surveys. Okay, so that was Exago with some promising next steps. And I just want to say a little bit about the future. So this is now a decade where deep learning is going to transform astronomy. Machine learning needs to transform astronomy because we're going to be swimming in data, like the nightly snapshots from LSST or the exquisite imaging from Roman Space Telescope. So I've already shown the kinds of analysis that are possible with advanced machine learning methods. Let's just take a look at how far wide area surveys have come. So this is just kind of a patch of sky of Sloan imaging. And these are the kinds of images that I used to, uh, you know, do the metallicity prediction analysis. You can see that the, you know, the quality of the imaging is, is, is not as great. It's not very deep. And we can compare that to the DESI legacy imaging survey. So already you're starting to see some lower surface brightness features pop out. And this deeper imaging is what we used for X Saga to be able to find those low Z galaxies. But now I'm showing hyper supreme cam survey, which is similar to what we should expect out of LSST. So going back and forth, we can see more low surface brightness structures emerging from this galaxy in the middle and some of the other brighter ones up here. And many, many more dim objects are popping up into the background. And then finally, I want to advance to uh, Roman Space Telescope with its Hubble-like resolution, you're now able to start, you can start to resolve, you know, spiral structure from all of these sources um, from, you know, and not just spiral arms, but also like bars and dust lanes, uh, tidal features, et cetera. For billions of galaxies in the high latitude Y area survey, um, we're going to be able to study galaxies in unprecedented detail. So all of these morphological features are going to be extremely important. And for the first time, I think that with machine learning, we're going to have the tools to properly study them. We're going to be able to make use of all this information. So that's basically what I'm working on at Space Telescope Science Institute um, on the Roman team. So you know, we're also trying to build up our machine learning expertise there. Uh, I think there's some other things I could say about the machine learning side, but I'll just say, you know, stay tuned for more. Um, and I'm going to head to the summary now, right? To summarize, we've been talking about the, the past, the present, and the future of machine learning in astronomy. You know, I've shown that neural networks are really good at figuring out galaxy properties, like the H1 or the metallicity or the entire optical spectrum. And that's because the appearances of galaxies are linked to how they formed and evolved. But I've also developed advanced CNNs, which are now being used to select an unprecedented number of dwarf galaxies in the low Z universe. And Exaga has continued to be very productive. Finally, uh, we can use novel deep learning techniques for making sense of the flood of data, uh, data that will appear when these new telescopes are online. So one of my goals is to empower the archival science that can be done, which makes astronomy you know, more open and accessible than ever before. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, if you have questions in the room, please raise your hand. And if you're online, I'll watch the chat. Thanks. Uh, my super question. Um, it was when you were talking about identifying the dwarf satellite galaxies, and you said that the success rate was less than one percent. What were the other you know, 
Um, yeah. Um, oh no, no, uh, no problem. Let me let me go to the slide in question. Maybe this one. Um, and I guess I should repeat the question for for the audience online. So the question was, you know, about one uh, percent or so were uh, you know these Lozy satellite galaxies. What were the other ninety nine percent? So in the context of Saga, you know the biggest contaminating fraction is just these high Z galaxies. So we know that, you know, most, you know, the, the, the amount of cosmic volume into, you know, within uh, what Saga is studying, which is only out to about 40 megaparsecs. And what we do with X Saga goes out to about 130 megaparsecs. It's, it's a tiny fraction of, you know, the total cosmic volume explored, you know, based on the, the luminosity uh, limits here. So um, yeah, so they're all just background galaxies, basically. There's a number of foreground stars too, um, and I don't think Saga is as contaminated by this, but sometimes we struggle with like reflected light and other artifacts in some of the telescopes. Um, but actually machine learning is offering really, really high accuracy ways to remove those things too. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, this is really amazing. Like we can uh, get a spectrum out of uh, our image. And so I've been thinking about the reverse, like in the Aaron Chain clip, I think we can like, imagine getting a spectrum of a very high sea galaxy that won't be able to be resolved. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like, <laughs> could your machine uh, um, like uh, learn neural net or some other ar architecture kind of go the other way? And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I realize, you know, the training, the, the, the revision and so on, but I, I was just thinking in principle, like something like this is possible. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, to repeat, yeah, so it was, if you can go from a, you know, an image to a spectrum, is there any chance possibly with even the upcoming James, or like ongoing James Webb mission, um, be able to go from a spectrum and, and see you know, from like a high redshift galaxy, which we have no hope of resolving, turn that into some sort of image? I think that's a really great question and really appealing topic. Um, you know, of course, we could try to forward model, do some sort of like simulation-based inference. There, there are a number of approaches I think that that could be viable. And of course, you know, my answer is really I, I don't know. Um, it, the the generacies can be kind of crazy, you know, like at times because you can imagine. I mean, of course, there are. I, I would say that you know, it's a lower dimensional manifold that the spectra live on compared to the image domain, right? This is something like a hundred thousand dimensional, uh, dimensional problem where each pixel is a dimension. Um, and this is like a thousand dimensional. And so, so you know, you can you imagine that there's many projections that might get you there, but doing the inverse um, is, is, is more difficult. So I think it's a really good question. Um, it would certainly be worth exploring. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Maybe I can see it if you want to. Um, I think, uh, how about you read it? Okay, so no. What kind of pre-processing goes on with the phone? Uh, that gets sent to the CNN, for example, are you masking it for an object in any way, or is it just working against it? Yeah, so, right, so I guess I don't have to repeat that, but yeah, the, um, there is minimal pre-processing. So, I mean, this, in fact, it, you could argue that we should probably do a, uh, we, we should use, um, okay, so the only real pre-processing is that we use the Lupton, you know, uh, algorithm for uh, rescaling, I guess, the, the brightness. And that's literally because we use JPEG images, right? Like in, if you know about like image like formats, JPEG is actually compressed representation. So it's lossy. It uh, is probably not optimal in many ways. Um, so if, if you go ahead and do this with the FITS files, which you know are, are lossless, uh, it, you basically get the same answer. So I think the amount of scatter introduced by some of those kinds of things is minimal. Um, in terms of like our, our stars and whatever mask, um, I don't think so. I mean, we, I guess, okay, so so these are all selected from the main galaxy uh, sample. And um, I think things with, you know, very bad flags with like light bleed and all sorts of stuff are removed. Um, so, so there probably is a, a bit of, um, you know, filtering out some of the data. Uh, I don't remember if we, but we certainly haven't done anything like remove, you know, foreground stars and whatnot. I mean, as you can see, for example, and this is kind of a different part of the question, this galaxy has a really annoying star in the middle of it here. And at the same time, we are able to use our, our uh, pan stars imaging of this, which, which I think also still has the star in it. Um, and it's okay to it. We actually did another experiment where we actually artificially injected stars um, into a CNN just to see what would happen. And it 
perturbs the, the predictions, but it doesn't actually introduce any bias, which is nice. Maybe just a little variance. Do you know how the neural net works? Like, does it kind of identify those patches of like those pixels as artifacts and kind of disregard it? Or yeah, the question is, do we, do we know how the neural network works? Like, does it does it mask or or, or you know do do some sort of implicit or internal pre -pro or processing? Um, my understanding, and this is again a, a guess, is that actually, like when you have a lot of different types of filters, you just end up averaging out signals that don't give coherent responses. Um, you know, like I, I, I mentioned that these are kind of like matched filtering algorithms, um, and and there's other you know things like wavelet scattering and and you know analogous models that that basically will tell you the same thing, which is that like if you if you end up with filters, you know that don't have just a giant star, you know, like bright source in the center, most of those will just average out to zero. And so the filters that end up being just like point source detectors or whatever may not be that important for these kinds of predictions anyway. So they're just downweighted. Um, I don't see anything else with that. I'll take the subscriber of that one question which yeah. is for the, the X diamond algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, given that it was trained for the ground truth for that algorithm was all in the field around Milky Way like galaxies. Is there a way to assess the amount of bias that you can see through that training sample? Or is that, for example, something that you have to do with the desi data uh, from the low mean survey to, to get a sense of how much the well Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I guess I, I should repeat that too. Um, yeah, so the question is that you know for X saga, you know, the kinds of yeah, sure, let's go to that. But the the idea is that all the training data actually comes from you know the surrounding sky, even if it's not the same redshift of the host galaxy. We're looking at low Z galaxies in general. Um, but you know, are they are we tracing a more biased environment? And I think that there's certainly a danger of that. Um, and it is something that we should and would like to evaluate when we do have the opportunity. So as Ethan mentioned, um, with the, the DESI program, you know, we'll have many more redshifts um, that allows to, to check for this um, kind of response. Right now, I don't, I, I don't think we've done that yet. Um, so so we, we definitely should. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's a really good consideration. Thank you. Actually, sorry, just to add on to that too. I mean, one, another thing you can do, which which is kind of interesting, is look at just the distribution of predictions and see how that systematically varies across the sky. So, like when you look at a plot like this, you know, you can you can are, you can try to see if you know your uh, the kinds of predictions that you're finding is going to be um, biased, you know, as a function of of whether there's a large, you know, a massive host galaxy. That's in the area, but not related to you know the background structure or whatnot. So I think there's there's some kind of analysis that we could do even without Desi. Yeah. Thank you. Should I stop sharing this?